Okay. Uh, great. Thank you all for coming today. Um, this is a uh, uh, February 2022 Tech Talk with uh, the Epic SEM team. Um, there's a few new members. So we thought we would use this as an opportunity to introduce ourselves and also kind of uh, do some sample prep 101, just that we've trained a lot of people in the last few months. And I don't know about the other two, but I've gotten a lot of questions on, you know, how do you even begin to start preparing your sample for, for SEM? So we thought this would be a good, good topic to go over. Um, you go to the next slide. So uh, my name is Elizabeth King. I have been working with the Epic SEM team since May of 2020. So I may not have met a lot of you in person, but I might have trained you on um, one of the Hitachis or done an EDS uh, virtual demo for you um, in that time period. I have, uh, I'm currently working on my um, master's online in material science. And I have a background in like uh, microelectronics and chemistry, um, like metal materials more, more than anything. Um, and I'll hand it over to Nathan. Yeah, I'm Nathan Laporte. Um, so I started part-time, half-time in Nuance uh, in September. I'm also the manager of the Giant Fab Core facility, uh, which is up on the fourth floor of J-Wing. Um, and I'm a staff scientist in the React Core facility as well. Uh, I've been at Northwestern now about six and a half years. I started as a postdoc in Mike Wazalewski's group doing ultrafast spectroscopy for artificial photosynthesis. Um, and then Mike and I started Giant Fab right uh, about two weeks, 10 weeks before the pandemic hit and shut everything down. So um, I've got a lot of different hats that I wear, but I'm really excited to be part of Nuance. Uh, and I will be probably the person training you if you haven't already gotten trained on any of the sample prep equipment for the SEM or the TEM uh, stuff and uh, pass it over to Nathaniel. Hi everyone, my name is Nathaniel Cabot, not to be confused with the person before me with a slightly similar name. Uh, I am a research associate with Nuance, primarily working on the SEM and focused ion beam teams. I have spent some time uh, at the University of Virginia and some startup companies before coming to Nuance in early 2020 and I have been here ever since. And that's my short little summary. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna start with the really, really basic stuff. Um, what, how do you mount your sample? How do you get started to put your sample into the, the SEM? Um, so you'll hear us talk about stubs, pin stubs. Um, and here is a box full of many different options. There are, um, fairly typical stubs. Actually, you can't see my mouse, so I, I keep pointing to things, but you can't see my mouse. Um, there are pretty typical pin stubs in the like center of the top row. That's what most people use. They're just little aluminum, like 12 millimeter um, discs with a little um, post sticking out of the bottom. There's lots of different sizes, depending on your sample, lots of different shapes. Um, some there are some techniques that require more specific uh, angles or maybe you want to look at a cross section so you want to have it hold it up at 90 degrees we have that as an option um, you can have sample or stubs that hold pucks or wafers uh, the ones on the left have those little clips on top of them those are great for wafers and you uh, don't need to adhere your sample quite as um, well as with the other ones but there's truly like an infinite number of stubs. And if you need a specific one, we can always help you find the, the right one for your project. Um, you'll also see those little uh, black ones in the corner. Those are actually made of carbon. Um, mostly they are made of aluminum, but carbon is also an option if for some reason you don't want aluminum in your um, interacting with your sample at all. Uh, but once you have your stub and you have your sample, you know, you have to put them together. So we have these adhesives that we use. You want them to be conductive. So these um, are two common types on the right is carbon tape. It's a double-sided tape that is, um, has, you know, carbon spheres uh, throughout it that allow the electrons to, to pass through your sample or from your sample to the stub to ground. Um, 
very easy to use. Uh, we have tons and tons of roles. They're all over the place. You've probably seen it before. And then on the left, we have these um, pastes that just almost work like a little nail polish bottle where you um, use it as a, a paint or a glue either to adhere it to the stub or to you know, draw a conductive line from the top of your sample to the stub, you know, depending on your, um, your project. So those are two options. There's many more, but those are really common ones. Um, on the left, we now, you have your sample on a stub ready to go. You need to insert it into the chamber. You'll have, um, depending on the microscope you're looking at, the Hitachis or the JOL or the, the Quanta, different types of sample holders. The one in the top right is um, fairly typical. It just holds the pin stubs. They come in sizes, different sizes. They can hold one pin stub to, you know, 26 pin stubs, however many that um, you might be looking at at once. Uh, on the bottom is a kind of a screenshot from one of our Nuance YouTube videos that shows you how to put together some of the sample holders. Um, the YouTube page is a really great resource for all of those different um, you know, niche ways of putting these sample holders together. Like I said, there's so many different kinds. It's kind of modular. You can put different tops on, different bottoms, different size um, for heights and different heights and stuff like that. So uh, we can really um, tailor it to your, your work. On the top left is um, the one of uh, a screenshot from our uh, JOL 7900 software where you choose the uh, type of sample holder that you are using. You can see there's a few different types that hold different, whether it's holding one pin stub or, um, or multiple. And just as an example of the different types of um, sample holders that are floating around Nuance and Epic. So any of these could work for you, or if uh, you need something more specific, like holding a puck, if you have like a cross section and epoxy, then we have some for that as well. So we'll go to the next slide. Uh, when you are mounting your sample, here are a couple of things you wanna consider. First, your sample is going into a vacuum. So only um, some things are compatible with that. And one of the things that is not is liquid. You cannot put any liquid into the SEM. Um, we, you might have heard of, you know, special circumstances where you would use environmental SEM and that is, um, you know, a, a consideration if, if you really need to look at something that might be closer to the liquid phase than, than the solid phase. But uh, in general, the rule of thumb is, you know, no liquids. Uh, you really need to have a solid to, to put it into the vacuum just based on the phase diagram, right? Um, and that's the phase diagram of water. And then uh, another really common question I get is uh, powders. When you are putting powders on the pin stub, um, how, like, what is the best way to do that? How do you do that without um, contaminating the chamber or uh, losing your sample or anything like that? And um, our best advice is put, you, you really need very little of your powder to get a good um, image in the SEM. So put as little as you can and then use, um, either a bulb or a nitrogen gun or compressed air or something like that and blow off the excess. And that way there's no excess uh, powder to you know, escape from the adhesive and get into the chamber and you lose your sample, whatever, um, you know, whatever sample it is, I'm sure you wanna keep it. So uh, the other important thing to consider is you want um, conductive samples, right? You're interacting with a, um, a beam of electrons and those electrons need somewhere to go. And if your sample is non-conductive, they will just sit on top and you know, congregate on top and give you uh, strange artifacts in your image. So on the right, um, we have, these are the same image. The one on the right is uh, conductive. It's been coated with um, a thin layer of conductive material. The one on the left is the same image. It was not coated. So you can see how uh, much worse that image is and how uh, difficult it is to, to really see what you're looking at. So um, to make your sample conductive, if it is you know, inherently non-conductive, we have um, two uh, metal or uh, conductive coders. One is a sputter coder and one is an osmium coder. And I'm gonna hand it over to Nathan to uh, talk about those. All right. Um, so uh, 
coding samples is a whole uh, process that you can do. And uh, like Elizabeth said, we have a couple of different coders and I'll kind of just talk about the different coders that we have, uh, the different metals or other conductive materials you can use to coat them, and then some considerations. So the first technique uh, is sputter coating. And so that's uh, done using the desk four sputter coder. That, uh, the technique basically, uh, you put your sample in vacuum and then you have a target up at the top. And then you have this beam of argon atoms that are accelerated by uh, an RF, uh, RF generator. And those argon atoms smack into the target. The target atoms get sputtered off and then they fly ballistically towards the sample and then they hopefully adhere to your sample and coat your sample in a thin film of the metal. Um, the sputter coater that we have is set up. Uh, we've got a couple of targets that we have and then you're allowed to bring your own target. So uh, for our sputter coater, we've got a gold palladium alloy, we've got a gold target and we've got a platinum target. And um, I'll talk a little bit later about the pros and cons of each of those. The other coder that we have uh, is the osmium coder. Now, there's a lot going on in this picture, but essentially the way it works is it vaporizes some osmium tetroxide uh, or sub sublimes some osmium tetroxide from the sublimation chamber, which goes in to, uh, into the sample chamber. And then there's a plasma discharge that oxidizes, or uh, sorry, that re reduces um, that osmium tetroxide down to osmium zero. And that osmium zero then coats your sample and is conductive. And what's cool about the osmium coder is that if you have a sample that's very porous or uh, reticulated or has a lot of surface area, because that osmium tetroxide is coming in as a gas instead of as kind of ballistic uh, atoms, like in the sputter coder, it can actually coat all the kind of ins and outs of your sample and do a really good conformal job. And then the third coder that we have that uh, you sometimes people use for coding uh, for SEM, uh, but people also use it for other purposes is a thermal evaporator. So that's in principle somewhat similar to the sputter coder, except that the method of evaporation is different. So in that case, you've got a crucible down at the bottom. Normally that's a tungsten or a molybdenum piece of metal with a little dimple in it. Sometimes we call that a boat. Um, and that is electrically heated using a high current source. The tungsten heats up basically like a old fashioned light bulb and melts the material that's inside. And then that material, because we're under high vacuum, uh, starts to vaporize and again, flies uh, in a straight line kind of everywhere, including hitting your substrate <laughs> and a thickness monitor. And so that thickness monitor tells you how much you've evaporated onto your substrate. And similar to the sputter coder, um, that's not going to give you a coating around all the sides of your sample. That's basically going to coat the face of your sample that is facing the crucible. So it's not a great choice if your sample is highly porous or has a lot of surface area or is a weird shape. Um, and that thermal evaporator is, but uh, what's the nice thing about the thermal evaporator is it does have the widest range of materials that you can use because basically anything that melts and evaporates you can use and you don't have to buy a big thick sputter target for hundreds or thousands of dollars you can use a couple of pellets of whatever material it is so even if you're using gold you know you're using 10 bucks worth of gold or something so uh, here's a picture um, that shows a number of different materials and what their grain sizes look like. I don't have osmium on here, uh, but the osmium is a pretty small grain. And so you can see the grain size, and these are all taken at the same magnification. The gold gives you uh, pretty big grains, but gold is nice because it um, sputters really easily. 
gold palladium is a little smaller, platinum is a little smaller than that. And then uh, if you want to bring your own target, you can get in, into other materials such as uh, iridium. It's going to be an expensive target, uh, chromium or tungsten. And then the other one I haven't talked about is carbon coating. Uh, the carbon coating takes place in the sputter coater machine, but it actually is just a thermal evaporation of the carbon. It uses a pair of carbon rods that get really close and then uh, there's an electrical discharge between them and that sprays off carbon particles everywhere, including on your sample. Uh, so let me just talk a little bit about the different materials that there are and um, kind of the ups and downs of each one. So in terms of grain size, like I said before, gold is the biggest grains, then gold, palladium, platinum, carbon and osmium are amorphous. So they'll give you the smallest grain size. Those are all suitable for low or medium uh, magnification and resolution. If you have really high uh, magnification or resolution needs, then you're gonna need to use either the platinum, carbon or osmium. And uh, our kind of rule of thumb is that if your grain size, if your feature size that you're trying to look at is smaller than uh, 100 nanometers, then you wanna use probably the osmium coder. Um, on the other hand, you can get a boost of uh, secondary electron signals by using some of these, some of the metals. Uh, so if that's important to you, then you'll wanna use uh, the gold or gold palladium or platinum. Um, carbon is good for backscatter electron imaging. Gold, platinum, and carbon are good for uh, EDSD. Carbon is good if you're doing EDS because you're, you don't have a different metal sig signal in there that's gonna interfere with your EDS. Uh, the osmium coating is optically transparent, which if that's important to you, if you wanna do optical imaging of your, uh, of your sample as well, then you'll wanna think about the osmium. The carbon is cool because uh, assuming that your sample is not an organic material, say it's a metal or ceramic or something, you can coat it with carbon and then uh, you can put it in the plasma cleaner, which Nathaniel will talk about in just a minute, uh, and you can remove the carbon again. So you can restore your sample to its pristine condition. So if that's uh, something that you need to do, carbon is a good choice. And then just some other notes, platinum is a very slow sputtering material. The carbon coder is kind of messy because it gets carbon black everywhere. Uh, and osmium obviously is a toxic material. So uh, you just need to be a little bit more careful when you're using that. So uh, that's it on coding. And I'll throw it over to Nathaniel now uh, to talk about sample cleaning. And then we'll have time for questions at the end. All right, one second, let me just scare, share my screen. Okay, cool. So uh, Elizabeth and Nathan gave us a great intro to coding and some of the aspects of sample mounting, as well as the vacuum required in terms of loading samples into the SEM. So what I would like to talk about here a little bit is sample contamination in the SEM, uh, what that looks like and some ways to mitigate that in terms of sample cleaning, best ways of storing your samples, if that's a new thing to you as well. So there are a lot of naturally occurring sources of contamination. You can or naturally occurring hydrocarbons. If you sit and leave your sample at your desk for a week, you're going to collect some, some junk while it's sitting there. Uh, you can have outgassing from the sample itself, as well as some amount of gases in the vacuum chamber. So even though all of our SEMs are, are well designed uh, to minimize contamination in the sample chamber, there's, only, there's always going to be some residual amount in these chambers. So these three sources can contribute, can contribute to sample contamination when you are scanning the electron beam uh, in an SEM. So as the beam rasters across the sample for somewhere where you're scanning, um, these three factors all contribute to uh, this buildup of a contamination layer where you are scanning. So you can see this sort of gray layer that as the beam scans here, uh, it builds up the longer and the longer that you scan. So if you have a dirtier sample versus a cleaner sample, this can be a lot worse. Uh, and that's how you get this layer uh, in the SEM. So what does this actually look like in terms of an SEM image? Uh, so over on the right-hand side here, 
you can see an SEM image of an indium tin oxide film on glass. Uh, the larger image itself may look okay initially, but if you lower the magnification a little bit, you can see these artifacts that were not there prior to scanning that come from the buildup of sample contamination. So you have this thicker bar at the top due to the scan direction and sort of these blackened features everywhere in this region. So you might be deceived initially to think that the images look okay, but if you lower the magnification and see some strange features, that's a sure sign that you have some sample contamination that you might want to do something with to make sure that you are getting the best images you possibly can. And this looks different on different samples, depending on what you are doing, what microscope you are using, uh, what techniques you are using. So some other examples here is uh, some buildup from some uh, energy dispersive spectroscopy when you dwell the SEM in one spot for a very long time, as well as some uh, carbon contamination buildup from a pattern silicon sample where the buildup of carbon actually appears to uh, visibly broaden some of the features, which can be a problem if you are trying to quantify uh, the line width of a, of a small feature in the SEM. So with that in mind, let's talk about a few different things that you can do to either mitigate this, minimize this, or, or attempt to fix it all together. So while you are actively using an SEM, uh, there's a couple different mitigation strategies that you can try to help minimize this. You can do your focusing and your alignments at a high resolution different from the area where you save an image to minimize buildup in the areas where you end up collecting an image. Uh, in some cases, you can simply use a faster scan speed to help limit the carbon buildup, although you may not get as much signal in your image. Uh, we have a few, there's a, a few specific add-on tools that you can use on the SEMs, some of which we have. Uh, you can use also use a cold trap. This will help collect contamination in the chamber uh, using, using liquid nitrogen. Uh, and this is available on one of our SEMs, the SU8030. One other is a technique that you can use is an in-situ plasma cleaning technique, where once you've loaded your sample into the microscope, you can use a, a plasma cleaner on that context. And I'll, I'll go into the details of the plasma cleaning in a second. Uh, but it's, before you get to actually using the SEM, there are some preventative approaches that you can take as well. Uh, so the number one thing that you can do is make sure that you are storing your samples in the best way possible, which usually means storing them in a desiccator or a glove box, something that is under vacuum or purge with a gas, uh, some kind of inert gas, so either like nitrogen or argon, to help minimize the amount of uh, hydrocarbon contamination that you can possibly build up. And additionally, you can also try to clean your samples prior to SEM imaging, or if you see carbon contamination, you can take them out and, and try to clean your samples. I'm gonna to try to touch on the most two commonly used and or most universal cleaning techniques. There are obviously many other ways that you can clean specific types of samples, but I won't really dwell on those too much. Uh, so I wanna talk a little bit on plasma cleaning and UV cleaning, which are both tools that we have uh, in the EPIC facility. So the basics for plasma cleaning is in the schematic in the center here, you have a small little vacuum system and an RF power as you have a gas flow in and you place your sample into the chamber where it says wafer. Uh, the gas flow with the applied power creates a plasma of whatever gas that you are using. And this gas is plasma rather will react with your sample and can, and all the byproducts from that can get pumped out in the vacuum system. So our system can either use argon or oxygen or a mixture of those gases. And there's a benefit to different ones in different contexts. So argon is more of a uh, physical sputtering process and the energy from the argon, argon ions will uh, physically remove atoms from the surface, whereas oxygen tends to chemically react with hydrocarbons on the surface and, and break those down to get them pumped away into the vacuum system and clean off the surface of your sample. The other tool that you can use is uh, what's what we call like a UV cleaning process. Uh, so on the left-hand side, uh, it's a similar setup uh, in a small vacuum chamber, but instead of a plasma source, you have an ultraviolet light. This ultraviolet light can break down oxygen gas into either molecular oxygen or ozone, and these will react differently with hydrocarbons on, on the surface of your sample, and it can break those down and pump them away into the vacuum chamber, which leaves you with a cleaner sample after the fact. And on the right-hand side, I have pictures of these two instruments and what they look like in the lab. And to, just to give you an example of kind of the benefit of this, uh, here are two different images of a before and after a cleaning process. Uh, so the same image I showed earlier, where you have this carbon outline on the top here, and on the bottom after a few minutes of, of cleaning, specifically this was from UV cleaning, uh, where you can barely see any carbon buildup on the surface of your sample. So it can be deeply beneficial if you have a, a sample that you're seeing this with or 
uh, if you want to, if you think you have a sample that's particularly dirty and you want to be cleaned. And that's all I've got. So any room for questions? Go ahead and uh, you can either put your questions in the chat or just unmute yourself and uh, shout it out. Feel free to unmute yourselves if you'd like to ask a question. You did such a thorough job. Nobody has any questions at all. I think you did. Um, well, if no one's any questions, thank you for attending our February Tech Talk. And look, we'll be posting a copy of this video on our YouTube channel. Please reach out to anyone at the SEM team. Just go to our Nuance website. If you have any questions you think of later on. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Thanks everyone.